It all started with a severe headache, dizziness, and nausea. Then came terrible chills, a fever in excess of 40 degrees, and fierce pains racking the back and limbs. It wasn't turning out to be an ordinary day for Arthur Payne, a 33-year-old delivery man working for the Central Wharf Company and patient zero of the bubonic plague outbreak in Sydney in January of 1900. After diagnosis, Payne, his family, and neighbors were quickly quarantined at the North Head Quarantine Station in Manus. As he was the first case of the bubonic plague in the area, authorities investigated how he got the disease. It was theorized that the flea was responsible for inoculating him. The flea in turn would have obtained the infection from a host rodent. At this time, Sydney was a bustling port, welcoming numerous ships from overseas and one of those ships could have carried the infected rat, with some speculating that it was a ship from Mauritius, one of the places where the infection was spreading the year before. Panic gripped the city upon learning that the plague had arrived, and for good reason. The bubonic plague is caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis. It is infamously known to have caused the Black Death of the 14th century, the most devastating pandemic in human history, killing about half the population of Europe at the time. The heavily populated areas in Sydney, combined with decades of unregulated building, led to pockets of slum areas and with relatively poor sanitation, made those areas prone to the spread of the plague. In response to the impending outbreak, the government instituted three measures to control the disease. Quarantine, cleaning, and extermination. One source states that the people infected with the disease were marched off in the middle of the night to be quarantined, and the names of those infected or diseased were published daily. With panic and fear also came suspicions and xenophobia, with migrants from Italy and China among those blamed for apparently importing the plague through poor hygiene and sanitation in their respective households. The quarantine period for suspected cases was 10 days but was eventually decreased to 5 days. For the first 9 months of 1900, there were more than 1,700 people quarantined and 263 were confirmed cases from among those. Areas around Darling Harbour, Surrey Hills, Redfern, and Waterloo were badly affected as these were areas where a number of laborers who worked on the waterfront resided. They were the most exposed to the disease due to their frequent contact with arriving ships from abroad. To clean up these neighborhoods and surrounding areas, a mixture of lime, carbolic water, and a lime chloride was used. Some houses had conditions so dire they had to be burned and demolished. By March 1900, the city council began encouraging the public to get rid of the rats in the city. Rat catching became a mainstream occupation and even children became involved. The government paid two to six pence for each rat, making it worthwhile to pursue. Tens of thousands of rats were exterminated by this means, with some estimates putting the figure to 200,000, many of them ending up in a special incinerator at Bathurst Street. The outbreak was considered over by the end of August 1900. Arthur Payne, or Patient Zero, eventually recovered but others were not so lucky. 303 people were infected and among them 103 have died. These figures are significantly lower when compared to those of other diseases during this time. This could be attributed to the strong result from the government and the public to contain the plague as soon as possible. In addition, Australian authorities had awareness that it was only a matter of time when the plague would arrive into its shores. As part of the third plague pandemic, the plague rapidly spread from Yunnan in China in 1855, where it was thought to have originated from, to places such as Hong Kong and the port of Numia, with the latter being only 2,000 kilometers away from Sydney. Many parts of the city were transformed because of these events. The rocks and waterfront areas were barricaded for many months. Houses in many areas were destroyed and many of the poorest citizens were left homeless during the epidemic. Arguably, however, the 
urban renewal brought about by the aftermath of the destruction paved the way for the rethinking, reconstruction, and modernization of those parts of the city, eventually transforming it into the Sydney we know today.